the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegan, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heika when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heika? Thus, the village of Centerville became Heika. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Haika. Two miles west of Haika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heika and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Rover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heika, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. Normally do, and we're going to run the meeting the same way as always. We've got a little bigger crowd tonight, but we're going to do introductions, and we just need your name. I'm Charlie Bauer from Duke, so if you're so and so from Keel or wherever, we're going to go down this way with the camera, cross that way up here, and then we're going to go on the back wall over here on down. All we need is your name and where you're from. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to our leader here, Kathy Sixel, and then we're going to start the meeting. At 7.30, we're going to have a five-minute break. And at the five-minute break, you can do all the visiting you want. Works out great that way. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kathy Sixel, and I'm from Newton. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Paul Jacobi from Cleveland. Thank you. Frederick Jacobi from Manitowoc. Thank you. Lloyd Geraldson from Manitowoc Rapids. Good. Nice, solid voice. Good. Joe Newman, Newton. Thank you. Joan Walk, Newton. Thank you. Laurel Papiernik, Francis Crick. Thank you. Diane Luco, Newton. Very good. Kathy Wagner, Cleveland. Thank you. Peg Cress, Town of Mosul. Thank you. Walter Cress, Cleveland. Thank you. Joe Cress, Town of Mosul. Good. Darvine Dine, Cleveland. Thank you. Alice Mathias, Cleveland. Okay. Laverne Mathias, Cleveland. Thank you. Laverne Wettenkamp, Hanatwalk. Thank you. Arlene Hubbard, Newton. Good. Geraldine Scheffler, Newton. Good. Hilda Rambat, Newton. Good. Bonnie Barnes, Newton. Good. Thank you. Audrey Ergel, St. Nadians. Good. Mary Jane Rotz, Two Rivers. Thank you. Selma Hugo, Cleveland. Thank you. Edith Lindsay, Cleveland. Thank you. <coughs> Marie Pippert, Cleveland. <coughs> Thank you. Fred Furcus, Manitowoc. Thank you. Uh, Rich Hankey, Manitowoc. Thank you. Chris Holzbach, Manitowoc. Thank you. Edna Huckman, Newton. Good. Rick Firesdorf, Town Mimi. Thank you. Abby Geraldson, Town of Manitowoc Rapids. Good. Carolyn Huckman, Newton. Thank you. Marilyn Hummel, Newton. Okay, thank you. Charlie Alcott. Okay, we have another lady here who would like to introduce herself. Go right ahead, please. Lori Pearson, Cato. Thank you. Colleen Ding, Cato. Thank you. Joan Geraldson, Manitowoc. Thank you. Heather Geraldson, Manitowoc. Thank you. Kay Schill, Glenn Biola. Victor Schill, Glenn Biola. Good. Now, when he's Cleveland. Thank you. Jerry Leonard, Town of Sheboygan. Thank you. Mary Ann Thompson, Sheboygan. Thank you. Bernice Erlicker, Sheboygan. Thank you. Cheryl Bauer, Newton. Thank you. Lisa Elfson, Newton. Thank you. Marie Rosenbauer, Newton. Thank you very much. Roy Elder, Cleveland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roy. Okay, guys, gentlemen, would like to introduce himself. Go right ahead, please. John Wiegand, Town of Centerville. Thank you. Bill Whitfree, Newton. Thank you. Okay, we got a young lady who's the spark plug of our group here, that's Greater Centerville Historians, but she's got a few things to say and regulations to abide by. Go right ahead. Good evening, everybody, and I want to welcome you to the Greater Centerville Historians meeting. Uh, we have a few, a few simple rules. Number one, when you speak, give your name, raise your hand when you want to speak so that we don't miss any information, and when you speak about a person, please state their full name, don't use a nickname because in a couple years from now we won't know who that is anymore. And uh, please don't visit while the camera is on because otherwise it picks up uh, the sound in the uh, background. And uh, if there's any pictures, always pass them around. So with that, um, I'm going to give the mic back to Charlie. He can start the rest of the meeting. Okay, Charlie Bauer from Newton. Uh, 
I also, we've got to do a little something different here. I got a call from Rich here, and some of you re might remember him from a meeting prior where he was building the models of the village of Cleveland where the railroad goes through, and he's got a couple of models in here. He's going to give you, uh, he's got about 10 minutes worth of questions he wants to ask you, so I'm going to turn the mic over to Rich. All right. The gentleman just arrived. He'd like to give his name and so forth. Go right ahead, please. I am Rob Spaulding from Cleveland. Thank you. Okay, got a gentleman here who will identify himself and tell us a little bit what he's about. Go right ahead, please. Oh, good. I'm Rich Hankey. I'm from Manitowoc, and I'm building a model of Cleveland on about maybe a, uh, like the first set of buildings on either side of the railroad tracks. I'm trying to model that around the 50s when things really came and went by rail. And I chose Cleveland along with Cato and a couple other communities, two rivers, and, and what I'm doing, I'm trying to uh, get as many photographs and information about some of these buildings. And here I finally finished the uh, Cleveland State Bank, and I've got a model of the Dares feed mill, and, and if anybody's got anything to share, stories, uh, other photographs of uh, buildings along the railroad tracks, Primarily in the 50s and before, uh, you know, you can get in contact with me, and I'd appreciate any uh, any information. I know there have been people that have been very, very generous in sharing photographs and and just some wonderful, colorful stories about your community. So, but I brought that bank along. I finished the the depot. I've got a model of the depot. Just the like just before it was being torn down. I got some great pictures of that. I've got the the water tank. And the, and the, uh, the <clears throat> excuse me, the hand car sheds, you know, like the section houses. Uh, I've got the 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 uh, cheese place, the Polly and Polly Cheese House, mm -hmm. and my next building is going to be the uh, the tavern. Now I met a guy, and believe it or not, I met a guy in Mexico last year that his family was part of that, and I didn't have a piece of paper to write it down. He said they found a bunch of boxes when they were cleaning it out. And I thought, boy, that'd be just the guy to have. Well, I had my swimming suit and a t-shirt and thong, or uh, what do you call it, uh, flip-flops on. And uh, and so I didn't get his name. I didn't get to write it down, unfortunately. So if, anybody, and if anybody's got uh, uh, some information, that, I'd appreciate that. So. Uh, I'm, we're going to hang around here till like the, the break, and if anybody you know would like to visit a little bit, I'd appreciate that. And then we have to leave at 7:30. So. so you're looking for some information to help guide you while you're putting those models together. Yeah. No, I I finally found enough pictures to to do the feed mill. Uh, <clears throat> I've got one from the north end, from the south end, and then I got from Earl uh, Stoltenberg was kind enough to flip through his uh, his album and got a picture of that from the west side after the Stoltenberg store burned down. The okay. Wood All right. So I was very happy to get that. Okay. And uh, I've got a little camera. I can take a picture. Any Anybody that has a photograph, I'll just pull that up. And I'll just take, I can take close-ups right then and there. Okay. So I don't have to take any pictures anywhere. So very good. Very good. Well, I thank you, sir, for uh, participating this evening. We're glad to have you, and maybe there's some out here that can help you out. Oh, very good. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay, we've got a gentleman here who has a microphone in front of him, and he'd like to speak a few words uh, about what's on display. Uh, Charlie Bauer here. And we're going to kind of start out to give you the location of where the town of Newton lies and, and the main road that follows on through. And then we're going to get to an aerial view where actually the first bank, the Newton Bank, is on, and I'll probably have some of the, our bank ladies over here. There's quite a few people here that actually worked at the bank at one time, so what we should have did probably ask, we might do that in the second hour here. Yes, we will. But first of all, this map here is the map of the town of Newton, and I think I'm going to do it up here off, off of the, the Kenya. But if you follow this road here, it goes around, and then you follow it, south you will come into Cleveland and if you go back to St. Wendell it would be down here by the red dot and this would have been the main highway. It, today it's Westview Road and it would come around this way and when you get over here this would be where Packer Inn is located. I think I got that right. 
Yeah, and then right in here would have been the little community. Now, some call this Upper Newton, and then over here would be Lower Newton. But this area right in here started building because the railroad was not here yet. And it's, it's very similar to the way Cleveland developed. You had, you had uh, St. Wendell and you had Heika. And when the rail came, then the community built up around the rail. And that's basically what happened in the town of Newton. But up in this area here, this was where the very first post office in the community of Timothy, this was called Timothy in here, and it stayed there until the rail came through. But you notice this road here had all the curves in it, and it followed on through. And it went all the way over to Clover. And then from Clover, it went north towards Manitowoc. Now I got a couple other maps here that I'm gonna show. Here now, the little, the little buildings here are already around the railroad track. You had a hotel on one side, a saloon, and over here was a hardware store. And this up here then would have been where the original Timothy Post Office was located. And there was a blacksmith shop up here, a Cloverleaf Clover store, a doctor's office, a cheese factory over here. And this here would be Scheffler Road. There was a school here, and then you get down the Highway C, where the church is, the cemetery. But we're kind of interested in this area right in here, where, where the first uh, bank was built. And... Uh, I got another one that's a little bit older than this. Look at that, you can see that Newton at one time was called Newport Station. And this is 1878. And the only thing here is this little store right here. There's no other buildings here. But you look at this name here, the Zeke, and this bunk here. And then there's a couple other ones. This is probably further off on the map. But anyhow. Tom Bunk is where the bank built on his property. And then, uh, I'm gonna have to switch photos that, that, that'll, that'll show you a better detail. What, uh, this Franz Meyer is over here. He was connected with the bank. Bunk. This Zeke up here, that name was spelled about three or four different ways. And now I think we're gonna we're gonna go to that the DVD I think that works. <coughs> and there are okay. Here's the village of Newton now, and this is taken in 1951. And this is that Jake Zeke's hotel here. This is the grocery store. At the time of the first safe crack, and there was. Mrs. Stanley Leschke's lived in here. The bank is located right here. And I'll, I got a picture, a better picture that I put up there. But if you look at this bank, the other bank is here, the second building they built. It's located over here. The hardware dealership is over here. And this is when, when the, the rail came through, this is where the post office was located, down in this area in the, in the hardware store. And this over here is the meat market. This was uh, it was a grocery store. It was uh, Wozinski's grocery store, I believe. And the, the meat market. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's just the garage or what. But today, this is the post office there in Newton. And what we want to do is. We want to talk first about this little little bank building here, and then we're going to talk about this one over here, and then we also have some photographs of the of the the, the bank building being built. Uh, there's one other. I'm going to have to have the light on again, and now we're going to switch from this DVD to a photograph back here. And I'm going to show a picture of that hardware store. Is the hardware store? Right. I've been get it focused a little bit here, and I have two photographs of that. Now this says on here it's Loloff and Sons. Now I don't remember it being Loloff and Sons. Does anybody in the room remember that being Loloff and Sons? And this is the same building now, but it's been added on. 
So it changes a little bit. But it, it went to uh, Eberhardt, and then after Eberhardt was Hugo Schmidt. Hugo Schmidt had it, and then who had, who had it at the end? Zimmer. Marvin Zimmer had it at the end. But that's, this is where the post office moved to. And now the next photograph I'm going to... The building was built sometime between May and October of 1921. And the building stayed there until in the 80s, 81, 82, something like that. And then Mid Lakes FS donated it to Pinecrest Historic Village. Well, they had it Not in that back spot, though. Not in that spot, no. They, they moved it back, right. Yeah, he's in the story now. Now, uh, any of the bank employees here, nobody remembers working in this building? No. <laughs> <laughs> and if they did, they probably wouldn't have meant to anyhow, right? <laughs> I was in there with my dad. Really? Okay. The latest county bank to be established in Manitowoc County will open its doors to the public tomorrow. And tomorrow is October 6, 1921. Its state charter being published in the Herald News today, the bank is capitalized with $25,000 and following is the list of officers and directors. The president was Louis Franzmeier. Now there was a Franzmeier on that map we showed you. Vice President Tom Bump. And we're assuming that's the property where the bank was built on. This cashier, J. G. O'Rourke. Uh, anybody know where he l would have lived? We have someone who works in the St. Wendell Cemetery. St. <coughs> Wendell Cemetery. Okay. And the cashier, Thomas O'Neill. O'Nelly. O'Neill. Director Louis Frankmeyer, hardware implement dealer. So, and I did talk to. I think the great granddaughter of this Frontmeyer here, and she said that uh, that was her grandfather that had the implement dealer, and they had it before Loloff. And Thomas Bunk, General Store, Jake Zeke at the hotel, William Stock, Frank O'Neill, and Max Brookshin, and Henry Rodewalt were farmers. So this is basically how the, how the bank got capitalized with with the $25,000. This particular bank also was safe cracked, but I, I, I don't know if we're gonna to get to that now or do we wanna to go to the other building? We really don't have a whole lot of information on who worked in the, in the small wood building at Newton there. We know more about the second bank and the building of the bank, but we I do have a uh, a DVD that I can play. We were out to Pinecrest, me and Jerry, and we actually went through the, 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 the safe cracking that took place in that bank there, in the, in the wood building. And then from there, when the bank was over at the new building, that was also robbed. And uh, I think we got enough time to get it in before due to break. And after we come back from the break, I think then we're going to turn it over to the ladies over here. We're standing in front of the original Newton State Bank building and it's got what is referred to as a boomtown facade and it was quite common in its day to build buildings like this. It just made the building look that much bigger and look like, uh, uh, like it was from a big city when it actually wasn't. The building is 12 feet wide and it's twice as deep. The building is located in the same situation as it would have been at its original building. And the front would have been facing north and the road in front what today is known as County U, County Road U. And on the, on the right hand side over here where that building is would have been Stanley Leschke's 
grocery store and it had living quarters above. So, and the distance is about the same. This, the bank building was about 15 feet, 20 feet away from that building there, so a car could actually drive in between the two buildings. Okay. Now, this structure was built sometime between May and October of 1921. And it, it opened its doors in October to the public. And it, it's, it stayed as Newton State Bank for many, many years. And today we're going to talk about the safe cracking, okay. which took place 16 years after the doors opened. And that would have been in April of 1937 is when the safe cracking took place here. And I don't know if we're going to get to that now or if we're going to go inside and show you the inside of the building. I just have one quick question for you, Chart, if you can answer it. What area did they use to enter the building? You mean the, the, the bank crack? robbers, yes. Oh, I, well, I was going to, you want me to, I can go through the whole thing because I, I, I got that process down how they did it. Oh, okay. Okay. If uh, I, it would be interesting at this point, if you got to have to get something, we'll, we'll wait no, on I'm, it. I'm good. I can show you. You can show me. Good. Now, you have to understand that there was nothing on this side of the bank except. The railroad's track came through here. All right. And the bank was on the east side of the track. All right. The railroad depot was on the north side of the, or on the west side of the track. Okay. And the advantage the bank robbers had here is that the, the train didn't always stop in Newton. Okay. And, and it didn't have to in the beginning because the water tower was in Cleveland. The train took on water in Cleveland. It didn't take on water in Newton. All right. But... The bank robbery took place on April 5th in 1937. Okay. And the safe robbers were never captured. So we don't know exactly how they did it, but the articles I read, the way the sheriff put it together and that, and the way it was reported by the people that first saw the robbery and called the authorities, what the robbers did This window here now was made for somebody to enter from the outside and they were all built that way years ago. And there was a storm window on here and you know years ago the storm window had the little wobbles on the side? Yes. You could turn them and take the window off. Correct. They took this window out and they leaned it against the back of the building here so it wouldn't be visible from the road. Okay. You remember that. They got the storm window laying back here. Yes. You got the grocery store with living quarters next door. Yeah. So you're not going to break this glass or you're not going to kick in the door because you're going to wake the people up next door. Right. They took out either a pen knife or a putty knife and he took the glazing out the window and then you could reach in and open the latch and this is how the one person entered the building <laughs> and then he unlocked the back door back here. Okay. I'll, I'll be right over there, Charlie. Okay, with Mr. Charlie Bauer, he's explaining the entry into the building. Yes, he took the store window, leaned it against the back here, so it wouldn't be visible from the road. Now, all these old buildings, all you needed was a skeleton key to get in there, and it, they're probably unlocked from the inside, so when the person crawled through the window, he could unlock the store. And it was important for him to unlock the store, because the two or three gentlemen had their car parked to the west of the railroad track and to the south of the road in a field. And from that area, they carried down two milk cans of water besides a acetylene torch. Okay. <laughs> now, you have to understand there's no yard lights on in 1937. It's pretty dark. Yes. So they made their way into the building here through the back door. They brought everything in. And then from there, we're going to have to go inside the building and we can kind of walk through the, the procedure of how they managed to crack the safe. Very good, Charlie. I'll be very interested in that. Thank you. Okay, I'm with Mr. Charlie Bauer yet, and uh, he's going to show us how those bank robbers were able to uh, do their job as far as getting in the building. A little more information, if you will. <laughs> Go right ahead, Charlie. Okay. Now, you, we were talking about getting the glazing off these windows. Now, the building was built in 1921. It was robbed 16 years later in 37. So, in 16 years, your glazing would probably look like it does right here on this window now. Correct. So, there was no real big challenge to, to open this. And seeing the cameras out here, yeah. the other thing I'm going to add right now is 
the, the safe cracking that took place here was identical to the ones that took place in Jefferson and in Whitewater. Okay. And they were both done in the post offices. Oh, but, really? But, but the way they did it was basically the same way as the way they did the Newt Bank here. So do you think all three of them were done by the same people? Okay, okay. Very good. And uh, you said something about water cans before. Yes, milk cans. Milk, milk cans, cans of water. water. Yep. Okay, where did they obtain that and what was that all about? Uh, why don't we cover that inside here? That sounds Let's good. Wait. The wind is picking up a little bit. <laughs> but it's a beautiful day no matter what here. Okay, I'm still with Mr. Charlie Bauer and we're presently inside the Newton State Bank. Is that what they call it? Yes. This is the original inside of the Newton State Bank. And you can see the photograph here is in the newspaper and they show the two milk cans. Now, what's really unique about the, the milk cans is it, it, the milk cans came from the Ed Gallagher farm, which is one of my neighbors just down the road from us. Okay. And we also got to talk to Ruben Goss at the time he was driving milk truck. And he knew that the milk cans came from that place there. And the next morning, Mr. Gallagher did not know that the bank was robbed, but he knew somebody stole his milk cans because they dumped out his milk and he called the sheriff. Oh. And, and there was, the sheriff came out there and he did take uh, plaster casts of the tire tracks, just like the same thing they did where the vehicle was out in the, in the field where they parked. So oh, okay. the, the, the tire tracks matched. Yes. So yes. they know that's where the milk cans of water came from. Okay. And the other thing... And, and Mr. Gallagher's farm was located approximately where? You have uh, a County, or... Road, County Road C and, and State Road 42. Okay. It's pretty close to the Elm Grove School. Oh, I see. Okay. No. Very good. And they just had to follow 42 to the south until they run into Newton Road and then Newton Road took you right into the bank down here. Okay. And, and if you notice the, the bank vault here. Yes. It, we're going to look at the one they have in this building here and it's, it's I'm going to say it's identical. Okay, uh, yes, uh, could you point with your pointer about the door and all that and the hinge point? Yeah, here's the swing out hinges here, yep. and we'll go over that in the, in the, on the regular safe here. The double combination, Okay. and then this round door in here. Okay, and the lower part there is the milk cans. Yes, the milk cans are here. Yep. These are the actual milk cans. Them are the actual milk cans. Okay. <laughs> and uh, they had Midwest number four written on a can, but the Midwest dairy said they sold the milk cans to Mr. Gallagher, I guess. Ah, that's <laughs> how they all come around the horn. There. Yes. Okay, very Now, these are the interest rates that were a long time ago, and uh, comparing to what we are doing today, it's kind of unique. <laughs> and we're panning here, we got a couple of windows on the side of the building, and we got the counter, is that what you'd call it? I would counter, I would call that a counter, yes. And they have bars up there for yeah. protection, if you will, I guess, in that area. See, Tellers. You it's, it's important to understand how the building is laid out here. The windows on this side are the west windows, okay. which faces the railroad track. There's nothing going nothing on there. over there. Nothing at all. There's nothing behind the bank That's right. back there yeah. e except the feed mill, okay. which at night there's nobody using. Yeah. But right next door on, on this side yes. was the grocery store and living quarters. Ah. So oh. that's why they came in on the west window over here. And we're going to go back on the counter now. Okay. And this is the window here where the gentleman made its way into the building here. Okay. This is how one guy got into the building. All right. Now you have to understand, they got themselves two milk cans of water they carried down, a acetylene torch, and a roll of roofing paper, felt paper they had with them. Oh, really? So I'm assuming this desk wasn't here because the door is here. Yes, sir. They came in here. And if you notice, the ceiling has lights. They had lights in yeah, the building. Yeah. Before any lights were turned on here, or before they struck the torch, they went around and they nailed black felt paper over all these windows to close them up so no light would come shining through the windows here. <laughs> and then, if you, you're going to have to bring the camera prop in here, Jerry. Okay. But this is the little safe the so-called torch-proof safe okay. that they torch. <laughs> I'll be right in there, Charlie. Okay, we're now behind the counter area. 
where the tellers would be working and uh, we're just panning to see what they were looking at, at uh, as far as customer things and, and as Charlie mentioned we've got a unique piece of heavy duty steel here in front of us. This, this is the safe and it's kind of unique because the, the front does turn a little bit here. So it's got a great big swing out hinge here. Ah. And it, just look at the size of that steel. Can you just, just rough dimension it for me, a diameter? Oh, oh it's got to be at least, a, at least a foot thick. Yeah. And I, I would say again a foot across diameter wise yeah. or even more. Okay. Okay, now we have the two or three and we're not sure, but if, if I was robbing this, this, this bank here or cracking this safe, there would be three of us. Just because we had to carry two milk cans of water, the settling torches and some roofing paper just to get down here. Correct. I would think three of us could handle that. Okay, now we got a vault full of money here. We got the windows totally darkened out, so we're gonna light the torch up. And lighting the torch up, they cut a hole in the back on the top right up here. Okay. And it was just that they could torch through there, just a tiny hole. All right. Then he took the milk cans of water and they filled it up until the vault inside was totally flooded with water. Okay. The next thing they did, they cut a hole, a square or a rectangle hole up here. It was seven inches wide and eight inches deep. Okay. And they peeled that steel back. Before they peeled it back, they had a cooler all down with some more water. All right. And then they pulled that steel back, and then they could get at the silver and the currency that wasn't burnt. It probably was soggy, but it wasn't burnt. It wasn't burnt. Not damaged, really. And, and how this was reported was Mrs. Stanley Leschke, who had the store next door. Okay. Her living quarters was up in the back here. She seen the storm window leaning against the back of the bank. <laughs> and she thought that was strange. And this was about 7.30 on April 6th. Okay. The, next, the following morning. morning. So she went out and walked around the west side of the building and she could see that somebody entered the bank here. Okay. She called the bank president. Uh, oh, I think it was Max Brookshin, but I'm not sure. Okay. And then they called the sheriff and that was Sheriff Norman Birkendahl. Okay. And, the, and the, the detective was Frank Tomchek. Okay. And they came here and the place was a mess. There was money tracks all over the place. There was water on the floor. And when the bank president got here, the combination still worked on the vault here, but he couldn't get the door open because the heat from there must have warped something inside. But, but the currency and the, and the money was gone. He says the, the notes were still there, the mortgages and some of the stuff were still laying on the floor. They just took the currency and the silver and they were never caught. Okay. This was a crime that was not... Never solved. Never solved, yes. Okay. And that's the little history of this little <laughs> safe cracking job here in wild town of Newton. <laughs> well, the way it sounded, these gentlemen had done something similar in their past yes. because they knew exactly what to do that would attract any attention, not attract any attention. According to the articles that I was reading, the sheriff figured it took him about an hour to accomplish all this. Oh, really? You know, so okay. that's quite a bit of time. Yes, know? it is. Yes, it you is. know, and, I, and across the road, the front side of the bank was the hotel that Jake Zeke had. Okay. Yeah, you know, of course, it was late at night. That's right. Nothing you know? moving. And and nobody said that they seen traffic stopping in front of the on, on the street or whatever yeah. but they were west of the village and they were parked in the in the, the field, field and they actually got stuck they used some blocks of cedar that they put under the tires to get on out so, <laughs> so that's it, right that was in spring it huh? was in april early april ah, okay. so, so it was a little muddy you know yeah yeah well and uh, could you give us a little information about this particular safe as far as the name that's on the base at all with that? No, oh, the New York Safe and Lock Company. Okay. Of the York, Pennsylvania. All right. And so that thing. Called, so called <laughs> torch proof. <laughs> now, this thing had a couple combinations, as I see there, yeah. apparently to unlock it. Is that right? They got two in the front. Okay. And then inside here, even, the little compartment up on top here. Yeah. They have another one here. Oh, okay. And you can see there's not a lot of room in there for, no, no. for money. 
The, the other thing, the, the headlines of, of the newspaper, and I should, I'm going to bring that in here and show you. Okay. But they estimated they got away about four thousand dollars in cash and, and currency. Jeez. You know, in 1937, it was, that was, was pretty, a lot of money. That's a pretty good haul. Yeah. <laughs> Day's work. Ooh, I guess. Okay. Anything else, Charlie? You can Not that I add can. to the story here, but. Uh, I'm sure it's what they got set up here is pretty authentic as to what would have been taking place here. Yeah. And uh, and this is the chimney that leads out. Yeah. Well, and, I, and the the bank itself was built on the Tom Bunk property. Okay. Which is lo located there in in Newton Station next to the railroad track. Okay. And he was one of the organizers of the bank. Oh, he so was. So the bank was built actually on his property. Okay. All right. And he probably just donated it to the banker. Okay. <laughs> was there another gentleman involved with him for uh, starting there, it up at all? Yeah, there, there was a bunch of them. Louis Frank, Frankmeyer, there was Frank O'Neill, I believe, okay. and uh, Max Brookshin. Okay. And I think Jake Zeke okay. were the organizers. Okay. Very but my, my main thing today was to just to go through some of the safe cracking, the, how it took place yeah. here. And it's just simply fascinating <laughs> that they had enough hood spot to drink milk cans of water down here with a simply torch. They, they, <laughs> they knew what they were doing and the problems they would con be confronted with. No. But no, this is pretty neat. I like this. Thing. <laughs> Very good, Charlie. Thank you. Oh, you get the killer, too. <laughs> This is just a copy of the Manitowoc Herald Times, April 6, 1937. Safe crackers get $4,000 out of the Newton State Bank. And you can see here is the, the bank president in the picture of the bank here. Or the safe, I should say, is here. Yeah. And then here's the, the bank itself. And that, this window they're looking in would be that window over on the east side. East side, there. okay. Yeah. Okay, and they show a little bit more of the, as we looked at before, the safe with the milk cans and everything that uh, were used to keep it cool. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, and with uh, Mr. Charlie Bauer, he's going to give today's date if he knows what it is. The 18th of March, Correct. 2010. And I'm holding one of the earlier photographs of the Newton State Bank. And the sign that we see here is the, was the original sign. The one that's out here now was replicated by Stocks Manufacturing no off, off of this photograph here. Good, good, Charlie. And you can see that it was this back window here yep. was the one they entered. And now you can see, if you follow the roof line across, you can see the grocery store with the living quarters on the back here. Okay, and the lady up in that upper room saw some oddity, huh? Yeah, saw the, saw the window outside there. Her name was Mrs. Stanley Leschke. Okay. And you can see the distance between the bank building and the store mm -hmm. was pretty much like what we have out right here. Right out here, yes. Yeah. Okay, very good, Charlie. Good job. Thank you. Okay, I'm with, uh, still with Mr. Charlie Bauer on the afternoon of the 18th of March. It's a beautiful day. And uh, he'd like to just add a little bit to, to when the particular building was moved out to this beautiful spot. Yes. The, the building was moved out here to the Pinecrest Village in 1982, and prior to that, it was owned by Mid Lakes FS, and they used it at their feed mill for storage of some kind. I'm not sure what they stored in there, but this is the original building. Okay. And it wasn't modified from, from, from when it was built. Okay. All right. So nobody demolished it or harmed it very much at all then. No. Okay, very and good. it's a good place for a bank out here. It really looks nice out here. It fits. It fits. Well, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Jerry. We're with Charlie Bauer and Ruben Goss, and uh, we're uh, looking into the Newton State Bank as far as its uh, lifetime uh, that it was in service. But right at this point, Mr. Bauer will tell us what has happened to that particular bank. 
and he'll tell us a little bit more what date it is and so forth. Go right ahead, sir. I forgot the date already. 19th. It's the 19th of February, and we're located in the hamlet of Newton, I'm going to call this here. Okay. And the photograph I'm holding here is a photograph, an aerial view of what was formerly known as Newton Station. And it was taken sometime in the late 40s, maybe early 50s. And in the background behind me is the last of the Newton State Bank, the way it looked before it was sold. And as of, I believe, October sometime, the, the bank was actually closed. Okay. And the property is for sale. So we thought we'd come down here to the village here and see where the Newton State Bank actually started from. Okay. And it is on this photograph, and it's going to be hard to see. Okay, we'll take that uh, a and, little bit uh, later. Then we can kind of walk over to the location where the original building was, and, and the bank building was built sometime in 1921. Okay, very good. And let's see, what road are we on today? Do you know if I'm This would be County U. County U, okay. And it's also known as Newton Road. Okay. I, I believe from the intersection here just to the to the right of me here, that's where the name changes. Okay. From, from by the viaduct here going east is County U, and from the viaduct going west is Newton Road. Oh, I didn't know that, Charlie. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Very good. Okay, we'll move to a different location and get some more video. Okay, we're still in the hamlet of Newton, Newton Station. So this is the railroad tracks that used to be for the Northwestern, going from Sheboygan, we'll say, in Cleveland to Manitowoc. It's now kind of inactive. And I'm with Mr. Charlie Bauer and Ruben Goss, and they're trying to orientate themselves. Uh, you know what the problem is here, Jerry? Just picture it reverse. Okay, I'm with Mr. Charlie Bauer and uh, Mr. Ruben Goss, my father-in-law, and we're here in the hamlet of Newton Station, I believe it is, and Mr. Bauer will get us on, located on this picture he's holding. Okay, the picture right now is orientated as we're standing in the village itself. And if you notice in the background, we don't have I-43 on this picture here. Correct. The, the, the direction of, of the railroad track, and I'll follow it through here, yeah. is from south to north this would be north yeah this road here is county u okay and this would be west and the road goes through the village here all the way to the east all right gotcha we get down here and today this is the newton meat market which is back here okay this was jack wazinski's grocery store and this building got moved it's the building is still in existence it got moved okay and over here is Jake Zeke. Jake Zeke. Okay. Which was a tavern, and I, they also had rooms upstairs to rent. Okay. And then back in here. Okay, that's good. Is the the second building the of the second building of the Newton State Bank, and I believe that was built in 1947. I'm not sure that date. Okay. And I do have that someplace. Okay. And the, the residence back here was Herman Goss for many years. And also the uh, president of the bank, uh, which was Brookshire. Brookshire, okay. So the banker lived in that house before, yeah. Okay, okay. Er Irwin Brookshire. Irwin Irwin Brookshire. Irwin Brookshire. That I did not know. Okay. Okay. And then. Okay, good. These buildings here, I think, belonged to Herman Aberhart, that was the yeah. implement dealer. Yeah, okay. Case implement dealer. The case. Ah, oh, the one with the big eagle in the The big front eagle in the globe, yes. Yeah. Now this little red building here, which is hard to see because it's kind of hit by the feed mill, which was on the west side, was the railroad depot. Okay. Right here. All right. And then this, of course, right now is Enrico, the feed mill. Okay. And then this little tiny building right here with the little kind of brown roof, that is the original bank building that was built in 1921. Okay, let me zero in a little bit tighter here. Right there. Okay. And the building next to that was what? It was a grocery store with uh, a residence living. You could, there was a apartments upstairs. Apartments or upstairs. Upstairs, upstairs. yeah. Okay. And this, the building next to it, at one time was a tavern. Okay. Today it's a post office here in Newton. All right. Okay. And uh, some of these, there, there's a residence back here. Yep. 
And some of these outbuildings here, I think, belong to the feed mill, but I'm not sure. All right. The, okay. Yeah, the feed mill had some property, huh? Yeah. yeah. Storage well, places. Okay, very good. And uh, no, I think we'll, uh, let me just go I, cut. Okay, with Mr. Bauer, he's pointing out something on the picture. Yes, we got the bank building right here. And you can see the little boomtown facade of the building there. And then you, this utility pole here. Yes. And now we're going to switch to another picture. Okay. But first, I think we're going to feed the store over there. Yeah. And we're just going to rotate it around so we kind of orientate ourselves the right way. Okay. And then you can see. Here we go. Here's that utility pole that was in front of the bank building. Okay. And, and this is the bank building here. That little bank building. Just that little tiny bank building. <laughs> And it got moved out to Pinecrest, and okay. we will go out to Pinecrest and videotape the inside and maybe get the dimensions and, and okay. kind of go through the, the the first bank robbery that took place over here. Okay, and that bank would have been sitting where? Right on this driveway? Right on the driveway over here, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So this right. area in here was not, not nothing. was nothing here yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So right where our driveway, <laughs> the present driveway is where this bank was located. Right, yep. And that'd be to the east of the railroad tracks next to that building, which was a grocery store? It was a store. grocery store. It was Arnie Rumbutt's grocery store. Charlie Schmidt had it for a while. Um, uh, Howard Holcomber. Howard Holcomber had it. Okay. Uh, there was a Leschke that also had it, and I believe a Leschke was in the store at the time of the bank robbery. Okay, yeah. okay. Because uh, my father, Ruben, said he visited here with the Holcomber family at this building. Is that correct, Ruben? Okay. Okay, I'm going to cut right here, Charlie. The main track is just in the site. It was on the site. So I always pick, it picked the mail up going towards Manitoba. I don't know, south. Okay, where we're? We're looking to the northwest. This is the present Newton Bank. Charlie Bauer and Mr. Ruben Goss, and we're still here in the Hamlet of Newton. And uh, we'll look at the picture a little bit more. We were talking about the location of the railroad depot. Okay. And that's long gone, and, and that was that was also sold and bought and moved down this road to the farmer over on, uh, I think on Daney Road, if I ain't mistaken. Okay. But this was the railroad depot here. Okay, let's... And, and somewhere along the main track and the side track for the feed mill was the pole in there to pick up the mail bag. Oh, really? Now, Newton did not have a water tower, so the train didn't have to stop here to take on water. The okay. train stopped in Cleveland, which was halfway between Sheboygan and Manitowoc, so the train had to take on water there. All right. Newton didn't have that luxury, so... The mail was picked up here on the arm on, at, on, on the fly. On the fly. <laughs> and that would go both directions? Is that Both, both directions, I'm understanding, yes. Yeah. Okay, all and, right. And I know I did talk to a guy that worked in the mail car on the train, and his job was to get the bag in, to sort it, and then get it ready to be thrown out at the next place where it had to go. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take another shot of the picture here. We have a heat at home, we can do this. Yes, we can do that, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're... It would, have been, it would have been this window right here where the entrance would have been made into. And Mrs. Stanley Leschke, early in the morning, who, who lived in that grocery store back there, came outside here, and she noticed the storm window leaning against the back of the building, and that's where she called the bank president, and then she called the sheriff department. And... It said within about a half hour, most of the local community was there at the bank, and the sheriff was kind of disappointed with that because they tracked up all the tracks of the of the of the, the, the people that actually robbed us so they could get any decent footprints. But they did go out and get tracks of the, the tire marks, and they went back to the Ed Gallagher farm where they stole the milk cans and actually got the same castings of the tires, the mud plaster castings from the tires that stole it. So they knew that was where the milk cans came from, but they, they never did catch these guys here. And uh, you girls have anything on the two compartments in that old safe? You identify yourself, please. 
Thank you. Where was the Gaelic from? From the bank. Okay, thank you. Right there. Yeah, there's the school. So if they if they robbed that there or they, they picked it up there, they just had to come down to Newton Road, I believe, and then take it in, which would have been this road down here. Would have been a straight shot into. Now we're we're assuming they picked it up there and then they parked in the field west of the community and then carry everything up to the bank to do their little safe cracking. Thank you. A, a young lady here who would like to say a few words and identify herself, please. Right ahead. My name is Laverne Wettenkamp. Thank you. I originally was a Wojcicki, and I lived in the Newton Meat Market. Okay. And my friend was living in that grocery store, and I stayed overnight by them. Okay. And we were up in the upstairs bedroom. We woke up, and we looked out, and we noticed the bank windows were dark. dark. But kids, I was only about nine years old, okay. we made nothing of it until the next morning. That's when we found out it was robbed. Okay. So did did you hear any other noises at, at, at the no, bank at that evening? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing at all. Okay. But then after a while, then they bowled the safe out to show us what they did. Okay. So that's about all I can remember. Okay. Uh, was there any people there that you could identify that were at the scene when you... Were there also? No, not around here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now this is the this is the second bank, and we're gonna turn the microphone over to the ladies here. But sometime before we end tonight, I, I wanna get everybody that was worked at the Newton Bank on tape here. Please. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over and I'll I think Carolyn is gonna start this. Yes, I was elected. My name is Carolyn Huckman. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I worked at the bank from August of 1968 until it closed in November of 2009. And I kind of figured it out. In while I worked there, um, there were a total of 10 cashiers, and I worked with eight of them. There were a total of 20 directors that we came up with, um, and I, or 25, and I worked with 20 of those. Um, I came up with 27 people that worked there, and I worked with 20 of them. So I guess a lot of people um, in the later years didn't hang around as long. Things got harder um, as far as uh, keeping records and things. Uh, when I worked there in the beginning, we would work from 8.30 until 4. Uh, and on Fridays, we worked from 5, uh, from 8.30 until 5.30. Then we'd close the bank. Um, I'm sorry, we'd work from 8.30 to 4. And we'd close the bank and we'd reopen from 5.30 till 8. And I don't exactly remember when that changed, but it was kind of nice when we uh, didn't have to work those late hours on Fridays. Um, our, the banks that we worked with, we actually had accounts um, at Harris Trust in Chicago, uh, First National in Milwaukee, Citizens in Sheboygan, and Manitowoc Savings Bank in Manitowoc. And Manitowoc Savings and citizens both were, if we needed cash, that's kind of where we would get it from. Um, while I worked there, I worked there quite a few years, it was just Newton State Bank. And then Newton got bought out by citizens, and it was Keel, Newton, and Glen Beulah. And then they sold the bank to Valley, and that was statewide, so it was we had offices all over. Um, and then Valley Bank got bought out and was sold to M&I, Marshall and Ellsley. And at that time, you couldn't monopolize a territory. So Marshall and Ellsley had to sell off some branches. Newton was one of them. And it was sold to First National Bank in Manitowoc. 
and then it eventually became bank first until it closed. Um, I really don't. I got, a, I got a question, Carolyn. Okay. You did say you had a list of the directors that from the beginning, if you will, uh, to the present time. Would you be able to lay, name those off, please? Well, I'm not sure if these are in any particular it, order. That would not make any difference. Um, there was a Franz Meyer. What was his first name? Louis Franz Meyer. And then a Thomas Bunk. Um, a William Stock, uh, Max Brookshin, Henry Rodewald, um, Jake Seek, William Bailitz. Urban Brookshin was a cashier, but he was also on the director board. Um, Otto Schmitz, Frank O'Neill, Edward Rohde, Roland Wogt, Herman Eberhardt, Hugo Schmidt. Emmett Rodewald, Arnold Stock, Eugene Stege, Leonard Vogel, Ralph Ploys, and Donald Schutte. Ralph and Donald were the last ones that were uh, actually directors. And then as far as the cashiers went, the original was J.G. O'Rourke, and then Urban Brookshin. Those were the only two I did not work with. The others were Daniel Maurer, Larry Lemahue, Eldon Walker, Steve Walber, Robert Dirkman, Jane Book, Diane Luco, and at the very end, Ginger Hummel was the ca uh, cashier between St. Nazians and Newton. Okay, thank you. Very good. Anything else that you need to indicate there? We can maybe pass this around. This is a uh, picture that I was given. It says compliments of Newton State Bank. Um, capital 25,000 Newton, Wisconsin. So it's got to okay. be old. It does not have a date on it. Okay. So if anybody would like to look at we can pass that around. And then this was a one of the banks that um, one has been one of the first ones that they had. It says Newton State Bank, Newton, Wisconsin. Um, it has a lock. Oh. And it has a number. This one is 24, so they must have made so many banks and then just sold them and gave them to people. Okay. Anybody has any questions? I don't have anything else. As far as the uh, original bank had 25,000 as their, what did they call that? Capital. Uh, capital. Mm -hmm. did, did you ever or were notified of the capital that was coming up the line as far as at this point? They always printed a, uh, a report okay. every year, so right. it would have been uh, logged. Marilyn, you have something there? This one was December 31st of 1980. Um, the capital stock was 100000 surplus was 450000 undivided profits was 83294 Reserves was fifty thousand three hundred and fifty dollars, and deposits were six million six hundred and thirty-one thousand three hundred and fifty-six dollars. Other liabilities were forty-seven thousand four twenty-four. And on the other side, it's um, the loans and discounts were four million one hundred sixty-three thousand three hundred fifty-three dollars. We did invest in U.S. bonds. And that was one million nine hundred ninety-nine thousand seven hundred and seventy-five. Federal funds sold six hundred and fifty thousand. Government agencies a hundred thousand four hundred and six dollars. The bank building value was fifty-one thousand nine forty-two. Furniture and fixtures was nine thousand two hundred sixty-one. Cash and due from banks was three hundred eighty-one thousand. $367 and other assets were $6,309 and no cents. And they totaled out $7,362,433 on both sides. Okay. Yes, Marilyn, can you identify yourself? Marilyn Hamill. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, as far as changes 
in the banking way of doing things. Uh, maybe there's uh, some, they call it posting years ago or things like that. Can anybody uh, take the microphone who wants to handle that one? Um, the posting machines were used to uh, implement accounts. And when I started, we had every individual, every business had their own sheet. We had stencils that every month you'd make new sheets. Um, businesses were every month. Some accounts were um, every month. Some were every other. Some were every three months. Just depended upon the organization or the person. Um, in the morning, you would uh, go through all the checks and deposits that were made. And you would go through and you'd pull every sheet out that applied to that day's work. When you were finished, you'd push the sheets back in and you'd go ahead and you'd post. You had, you had before you push them back in, you'd add them up. And then when you'd push them back in, you'd post and leave them out as you did it and add them again. And of course, everything had to match. If it didn't, you just started over and tried to figure out who got posted to the wrong day or whatever. Okay. Uh, as far as maybe I'll go to Marilyn for one more time. But Marilyn, as far as your job uh, description at the very beginning when you started there, and if you could indicate that, uh, how did it move up from there? First, you were just an employee. You had no, no title. No title. <clears throat> After that, it was um, I never was a cashier. I was going to be a cashier just before they changed to a different bank. Okay. Um, what I was going to tell you that when when you took the checks in, you had to type them on. There was a sheet of paper that you had sent checks to Milwaukee with that, and you had to put the date of the check, the number of the check, who wrote it, who um, deposited. It, and then the amount. And then after that, you had to add up the checks. Well, we just had an adding machine that had a handle, and you just pulled it down. You put the numbers, and you pulled it down. Yeah. Sometimes I worked a long time after 4 o'clock because we had so many checks, I couldn't get it done at that time. Wow. <laughs> and I didn't get paid any extra money. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you okay. know when that brick building was built? That brick building? Yes. 1942. I started there in 1948. 1942. And this is a photograph that was taken on the 25th anniversary mm -hmm. of the bank. Can you identify the people on here? Yes. The, the one on the left is Ed Rohde, William Baylor, Otto Schmidt, Mr. Brookshin, uh, uh, Frank O'Neill, and Herman Eberhardt, and then Jake C. This was this was a photograph taken on the 25th anniversary mm -hmm. of the bank. Okay. I spent I spent most of my life there. I would say, well, how old, if I may ask, how old were you when you started? I was. I graduated in May, of August, 1948, and I started in uh, August. Okay. Annabelle Brick was getting married. Oh, she was uh, working there before you. Yes. <coughs> and for okay. a long time, I worked alone. Okay. Um, total is 64 years. Wow. Well, Not all full time. It's a part time. Okay. But they never took me off the payroll. Wow. <coughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Got to know a lot of people. <laughs> Thank you. We got a gentleman who has a question and he can identify himself, please. Paul Jacoby. Carolyn, who was the last working with you when they closed the bank yet? Because I remember you people all. Identify yourself, please. There's a question on the floor. Go right ahead. Uh, Carolyn Huckman. Um, 
the very last people that were working, myself, um, Joan Walk, Joan Newman, Cheryl Bondi, Laurel Papernik, and um, Ginger was back and forth. Okay. Oh, yeah, I said Cheryl. Cheryl Bondi, I think. Yes. Thank you. Okay, if you could give your maiden name also, we'd appreciate that. Okay, I'm Apollonia Lipke Geraldson, and I was born and raised in the town of Newton, and now live in the town of Mantuac Rapids. And I just want to thank the Historical Society for inviting me here tonight. It's my honor and privilege to share in the program. I uh, worked at Newton State Bank in this second building for about two and a half years. I started right after graduation from Valors High School. I graduated in 1951, and that was in May, and I started at the bank with Mr. Brookshin uh, in July, probably beginning of July uh, 1951, and worked until uh, 1950, let me see, 54, or no, 55, I guess. Anyway, uh, when, we, when I started working there, it, uh, the schedule was from 8 to 12. And we closed for the noon hour. Mm -hmm. And then we opened again at, from 1 to 4. And I also worked Friday nights, 5.30 until 8, okay. every Friday night. And we did have off election and watch President's birthdays. And it's a lot different now. Uh, the bank was, of course, you heard, was organized in 1921, and we, it opened for business in that same year, in October. Um, the robbery, the first one was in uh, 1937, and I happened to be working with Mr. Brookshin at the bank. I was the lone employee then. Uh, I didn't work with anyone else besides Mr. Brookshin. There was no other bookkeeper or anything, and uh, I happened to uh, be there just when the robbery was. Oh, can I back up a bit? Okay. You were talking about 1937. I think you mean a different... Okay, no, in 19... Um, let me see, 50... 53. 53. Oh, okay, there we go. That's when I was... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. <laughs> I do remember going in the very first bank building oh. as a young... Girl okay. With my father. Okay. But that's a long time ago, so I don't remember too much about that. But anyway, uh, you wanted me to tell a little bit about the robbery. Absolutely. I was uh, doing uh, the checks. I was sitting in the bank, facing to the south. There was a parking lot right out in front, so of course you didn't really get too excited, or you kind of the cars parked right out in front, so I didn't really. But I was busy. I was doing what Marilyn said. A typing of the checks up to send to the clearinghouse in Milwaukee, and I was at the typewriter, and uh, I did see this young man start up the steps, or just maybe before he even got to the steps, he had a khaki kerchief around his neck, and as I saw him approach the building, he pulled this up. It was just like it's so different now. They wear ski masks and everything, but it was like the old Western movies. So I knew right away what was up. And I was instructed when I started there that uh, if this ever happened, I should do whatever I was told. So this uh, young fellow came in, and uh, I announced to Mr. Brookshin, hold up. And he darted in the back room because I'm sure he planned on going out the back way, maybe to get to a phone and do some calling or something. We did not have any alarm system at that time. And so he went in the back room, and there was one other customer in the bank at the time. His name was Lottie Stefaniak. And I think he died not too long ago. But anyway, we were instructed. This young man came in, and... Um, he said, this is a stick-up, and he threw me, just what you see here, a brown paper bag, and it was all crushed up, just as you see this. This isn't the original, but <laughs> anyway, this is, I thought, oh, you know, this is kind of strange, but I did, and he must have just asked for the currency, because I never touched the, um, 
the coins that were on top, you know, by the window. But anyway, uh, I put the money in the currency, and I think I was not really, you know, you just, um, it all happened very quickly. I don't think I thought, I, I was really conscientious. I thought, oh, I have to make sure I uh, get a good look at him so that I could identify him. But of course, you know, you can't see too much when they have the kerchief up over their nose part. But anyway, uh, he instructed Mr. Stefaniak to put his hands up and face the north wall. And after, it must have been after I put the money in the bag that he also requested me to turn and face the west with my arms up in the air. And you know, it just, he was, you know, it all happened very quickly. So as soon as he left, I uh, thought, well, I kind of knew quite a bit about cars in that time, and I knew it was a, a Plymouth, and I think it was a 41 Plymouth. And um, so Mr. Brookshin came out, and he called the, uh, he got on the phone right away and called the garage because this robber headed north, uh, west, up toward the other new room. And he called them the Rotor Motor Garage and told them to watch for this car. And then two people from up there did follow this automobile. Can you name those two people? Uh, it was Charles Petrick and Elroy Rotowalt. And they per kind of pursued after him. And I guess he uh, had a little, I think they were really in harm's way. And I don't know what we did at the bank, probably. Not much of anything. We must have locked up, I suppose. Anyway, uh, we balanced, and it was about $7,511 or $7, that he had taken. But you know, when he left, I was so thankful that he didn't lock us in the vault. Because to me, that would have been kind of scary. But uh, there was a little pipe in the vault, if we would ever get locked in there, that you could breathe. But uh, down at Elkhart Lake, now they did. There was a robbery down there, wasn't it? And I think they got locked in the vault. So I was very thankful not to be locked in the vault. And he never requested me to go in the vault. I don't think he wanted to spend that much time with the robbery. But anyway, they followed him, and uh, he was picked up that late afternoon. Uh, the, I read some of the articles that Charlie had, and I do have this. Um, article with a picture of Mr. Brookshin and myself. If you want to look at it, you know, later on, it'll be just laying here. And, um, I guess that kind of, I thought I went down to the bank, to the courthouse that night yet, but I don't know, Marilyn said it was the next day. I was called in the next day to take well, care of the... They got a young lady who uh, also was involved uh, the next day, I believe, and she'd like to identify herself. Go right ahead, please. Yes. Marilyn Hamill. Thank you. Uh, I was called that day. I was to come in at the, um, a certain time, and the two of them had to go to the courthouse for some verification or whatever, and I was there until they came back again. Okay. I was there alone. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, I got a question pertaining, did, was there a confrontation between Rhoda Wall and uh, the other gentleman and the robber? Yes, there was. Uh, apparently, I wasn't there, but I heard he had shot into the air a couple times. So the gun was loaded, and I guess I thought it was, I said once it was a handgun. It really wasn't. It was kind of a pistol. I know it he had a barrel. It looked like a Western style. Gun. I don't know much about guns, but he did shoot a couple times, and now in the paper it said something about twice into the ground, but I understood it was into the air, but I really don't know. Okay. And did that robber get captured? Did the robber what? Get captured. 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 Yes, they picked him up. Uh, I guess he kind of headed toward Chilton. And I think they picked him up um, maybe on highway, it was 32 and then, now it's 67, okay. the way I understand. I okay. Know. But, you know, after it happened, then I kind of 
I've been thinking about it. I think about it more now. This whole thing come up. Um, you just don't, um, at the time, you just don't, it didn't really bother me too much. I have a friend who was held up at First Wisconsin out on Memorial Drive, and she wouldn't even go back there. But I don't know. I guess maybe when you're young, it doesn't bother you. Okay. But I guess that's the story about the holdup. And uh, just a little addition to some of the, they said that we didn't have very many machines. I run across this book, and it was uh, pretty much all by hand. This was from Newtonburg District Number 1. I had access to this bank book, and it was a savings account. And I found Marilyn's handwriting in there, and I found mine in there. And it's kind of interesting, but most of it was Mr. Brookshire's. But we did enter in the past books all by hand at that time when I worked there. I think that um, I guess I made a lot of friends. I still keep in touch with some of my Newton friends. And um, I guess I really enjoyed my work very much. And I would just say Mr. Brookshin was a wonderful boss. I never got scolded once. <laughs> Maybe I just did everything right. <laughs> but I really um, was my pleasure. And then, of course, uh, being married, raising a family, and working on the farm just kind of took me away from the bank. And I was called back. Someone uh, left the bank that was working there, and I was asked to come back. And I, I'm not so sure just how long I worked there. But um, I did um, go back and help them out a little bit. So I think that, yes. I need the microphone to ask you the <laughs> or, or Jerry gets upset. <laughs> I'm assuming this is you here? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the cash store? That's correct. And you had to stick that bag of money under this little yes. thing here? It was, uh, yeah. My, my, is question, <laughs> my question is, what denominations was the bills? Because you had over $7,000 in your drawer, I and would. it was like the... The 29th of July was towards the end of the month. Was that normal to have that much cash in the drawer? And were they $100 bills or, or 20s? And how many 20s are in the pack? Because $7,000 looked like it wouldn't slip under this thing here. <laughs> well, it did. Uh, it did, according to the picture. You know, the bag looked, um, you know, that it wouldn't slip under there. I suppose you could push it down. He didn't, he must have just asked for currency. And, um, that wasn't a real large amount. I don't know. We always got uh, currency, uh, like we had accounts with the Man Mantua banks. I think it was the savings bank and First National. And uh, Mr. Brookshin would go into Manitowoc and get the currency or whatever we needed. And he would bring it back out to Newton. So was that $20 bills you gave the, the I don't know. or hundreds? I or? Was, I really don't know it was, it was, whatever was in the drawer. I don't suppose there would have been too many hundreds. I don't know. I really don't know, Charles. Any, any girls? Any? Got a gentleman who raised his hand. He might have a question or two. Uh, hi, Fre uh, Frederick Jacoby. <coughs> My brother has one question, what day of the week? And I was wondering, what exactly did he say to you? Do you remember? I think he said, this is <laughs> and then give me your... I think, you know, I'm wondering. was it on a Thursday? I would have to look it up to be sure. I'm just kind of guessing. Have you got a date? The date I've got a perpetual calendar was calendar. Uh, <coughs> July 29th, 1954. Three. Oh, three. Excuse me. <laughs> And as far as uh, what day, uh, you're going to look it up? I'm, well, I've got a perpetual can, calendar. Oh, okay. Um, Did you actually see the handgun that he pointed at you? Yes, and you know, I said it was a handgun, but it was, I don't know if you, I don't know that much about guns, but it was, it had a barrel on, you know, it was a Colt, <laughs> you know, it wasn't that, it was about, uh, what? 12 inches long, maybe. I don't know what that is. I think I wrote it down. It uh, was a, a revolver, I guess. You call those. I don't know. But I, he must have, I think he had been drinking a little bit at the bar. Mr. Zeke had a bar over there, and uh, I think it was on the spur of the moment that he did that. Okay. I, 
and he uh, he was kind of when he was questioned, he acted very uh, according to the newspaper. Uh, he talked to the authorities very rough. He said, "Hey, copper, you're supposed to be come back here. You're supposed to be watching me." That's what the newspaper said. I wasn't there, but um, he just looking at his picture. I, you know, I thought he acted kind of strange, but um, he wasn't mean or rough or anything. Okay, but is quite an experience. I think of it now, maybe a little bit more than, for years I didn't even talk about it. This came up and so it's kind of interesting. Thank you. I used to host up at the, the old building up at Pinecrest and oh. then uh, I used to, you know, give us some information out and I tell the kids I was one of the ones that was held up and all these kids, would, their eyes would get real big. <laughs> so, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Logan was, was a bank you. robber. Uh, caught, uh, yes, I think within maybe uh, three hours. And I question whether he was brought back to me on a talk. I just don't know. I would like to find out. Thurs it said Thursday afternoon, f Fred, in, the, in some of the articles. Those are Charlie's articles. So. Very good. I don't know if there's any other questions. Thank you. Okay, we have a young lady. Raise her hand. Right ahead, please. I'm Alice Mathias. I'm just curious that she had $7,500 in your drawer. Would, no, no. How much did they have? 7000 I think. Yeah, 7500 That's yeah. a lot of money. In those days, I worked at the bank, and we, I think our balance was always like 2500 the most. <laughs> That's why I thought maybe some of the vault money was in her drawer, too. Thank you. Okay, we have we a question. always on the week. Your name, please. Your name. Oh. <laughs> Apollonia Jarlson. Thank you. Uh, we always did, uh, Mr. Brookshin would always make sure we would have enough change because some of the bar people that own the bars, uh, people would cash their checks on Friday, their paychecks, and... Uh, Maybe that's why there was $7,000. It doesn't sound like so much. I don't know. Uh, we balanced, and that was it. And there was no money taken out of the vault, uh, the, the safe in the vault. It was all from the cash drawer. One drawer. One drawer. OK, thank you. OK, I have a gentleman here who had a question. Walter, go ahead. You have more cash drawers at the new bank, right? Carolyn? Cash drawers? A young lady's been asked the question. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Carolyn Huckman. Thank you. And in the new bank, um, each teller had a drawer. And um, so the drawers were, whoever was working that particular day, if, if you weren't working, your cash was locked up. Um, yeah, you had limits. Um, but that really was not out of line. This, I don't. I don't think it was really out of line. I mean, okay. at the end we kept less cash. Now the last couple of years, you know, mm -hmm. you'd have like maybe five or whatever. Okay. But I got a question. Do you remember when the drive-in was initiated at the bank? That was. Um, are you going to go through uh, when it was? Uh, when it was, the addition was built. Oh, okay. But, oh, she said 73, 1973. 1973, thank I you. I can tell you the first person who used the drive through Okay. Was uh, Jack Wettenkamp. He was a uh, paraplegic. Okay. And he always came with his truck, and uh, he was the first person to use. Okay, very use good. the drive through Very good, thank you. I'll lead you in. Uh, we have a young lady here who would, uh, also maybe was an employee, and she'd like to identify herself, please. Go right ahead. My name is Lori Pearson. Yes. And I or put the mic open. My name is Lori Pearson Thank and you. I worked at the bank from May of seventy three to November of eighty nine. Okay. Um, the reason I applied, my older sister, my mom told her you should go down to the bank and apply for a job. She was two years older than me. And they were building on in seventy three. She said, they're building on, maybe it be a job for you. Sure. And my older sister said, oh, I don't want to work in an office. 
So I went and applied. <laughs> and I started part time um, in May and then I graduated in June of okay. 73. And uh, the gentleman or whoever, who hired you? Danny Maurer. Danny Maurer, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Okay, we got a young lady who was an employee at a, a place that's important and she'd like to identify herself. I'm Joan Newman. Thank you. I started May 20th, 1991, and I worked the very last day, November 21st, 2009. Okay. I started out as a limited part-time worker, and I became a teller after that. Okay. Very and good. I liked it very much. Okay. And where, and where do you live right now? I live... I live 2.4 miles from the bank, okay. so <laughs> no, storm, no storm kept me home. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good. And your name, please, and your uh, occupation there? Hi, my name is Joan Walk, and I was uh, employed there part-time as a teller from April of 95 until they closed in November of 2009. All right. I started there. I always wanted to work at a bank because I was home milking cows. Mm -hmm. We sold our cows okay. in 95, and a week later I started training to start at the bank. Okay. And I was very happy to be there. I enjoyed my time there, meeting all the nice customers. Okay. But I also enjoy retirement now. <laughs> okay. And who was the uh, boss or the uh, head of the bank that hired you? Uh, his name was Steve Walder. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And we got another young lady here. You identify yourself, please. I'm Laurel Papernik. Thank you. And I started in May of 2005. Um, became Diane's secretary, the lady next to me. Okay. Uh, loan processor, backup teller, um, customer service, new accounts, things like that. Right. I did a transfer from a Two Rivers branch, and I started there in 2003. I was there at the Newton Bank until they closed November uh, 2009. Okay. I am still employed with the bank. Okay. First National. Right. And. Uh, and do you live in the immediate area at all? I live in the Francis Creek area. Okay. So, still live there. Thank you. Very good. And what do you hear, please? Nice and loud. I'm uh, Diane Luco. Thank um, you. Gosh, I started in the bank in 1986. I was still in high school. Yeah. I actually worked through the co-op program. And um, what high school did you go to? Keele High School. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I started in the keeping department um, in... 89 is when I actually took over for Lori Pearson as a teller. Okay. And then I did new accounts as well as loan secretary. And then I became a loan officer in 94. And um, in 90, uh, let's see, in 2009, um, I was transferred in between the Custard Street office and Francis Crick office. Okay. And then my employment also ended on the last day okay. that uh, Newton was open in, right. in November of 2009. But you're still working for the staff? No, I am no longer employed with the bank. Oh, okay. And uh, where do you live at this present time in relation to that bank? In relation to the bank, I live about three miles away. Okay, very good. Thank you. So I always followed Joan when she Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if she was late, you were late. Yes. <laughs> okay, and who would be got a young lady here who uh, would like to identify herself and indicate that she was an employee also. Go right ahead, please. Kathy Wagner. Thank you. And when did you start? Or, uh, I don't remember the dates. Okay. Any year at all? No. Okay. And uh, what did you do at the bank? I was at the teller's window. Okay. And you said you uh, helped out? I never out? thought about getting held up. You never thought about getting out. I never thought about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> you never did either, did you? No. Okay. And you said you helped out at certain times. Is that what? Summer when people went on vacation. Oh, okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Okay, we've got a young lady who uh, raised her hand and she has something to say and she'll start by identifying herself, please. Go ahead. I'm Geraldine Scheffler and I worked at the bank when I was a senior in high school. That was in 57, 58, and I worked until just before my oldest daughter was born in 61, February, okay. or January. Okay. And I did everything like most of the other ones did working there earlier years. Okay. And who was the person that hired you at that time? Urban Brookchen. Okay. And I worked with Marilyn and Joanne Lutze worked there. 
uh, I think that's all. Okay. And your job again was what? Everything from no. soup to nuts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what high school did you go to, by the way? Graduated from Valders. I okay. guess all the employees came from Valders. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Employees were there at one time, the largest amount. Thank you. Hartman. Thank you. I think the most people that were working, there were sometimes seven people hired. I think that was the most. But I think the most that ever worked at one time was five. Okay. And the majority of time, well, in the end, we, three and four. Um, Mondays and Fridays, you always worked with extra people, and then the rest of the week was slower. Okay. I just have a question. The videographer, Jerry O'Neill, uh, what do you call it, uh, the bonds, uh, federal bonds or something that you could buy, uh, savings bonds, do they sell them anymore or is that sort of a past thing? U.S. savings bonds, you can still buy them. Okay. And they come in different denominations, um, all the way up to 5,000, I think. They start okay. with 100 is probably your... Okay. I thought maybe they had gone out of out of style. No. Okay. I think the bank, as it looks today, before they closed it, and I'm going to start here, and I'm I'm assuming this is either the building committee or the people that worked in the bank, and can somebody get the lights back there? I'll I'll turn it over to Carolyn. This was the board of directors at the time of the. Uh, addition being built, and from left to right, uh, Roland Vogt, Hugo Schmidt, Emmett Rodewald, Roland Ohm, Arnold Stock, Frank O'Neill, and Herman Eberhardt. Okay, now these pictures are just going to cycle on about a 10 or 15 second level deal here, and it, it kind of shows the construction of the, of the building. You notice all the trees and that, the parking lots on this side. This is actually the east side of the building. The road would be in front here. See, now you notice all the trees are gone. So th this is some of the photographs we, we uh, picked up from, I think Joan had some, and they, they were in the basement. Anybody identify this girl? I believe that's Marilyn. Hi, Mom. Really? I think so. <laughs> she was always taking pictures. <laughs> what year was this again, Charlie? 73. Okay. <coughs> the outside you can see is concrete and then they, this is cement blocks. They actually built some other little rooms down in here. Here's the grocery store and then Old Bank would have been located over there. This is the, the stone that they put on in front of the building, the facing stone. Spancrete truck here, or Spancrete going on. I believe the floor was Spancrete they went across, and also the roof. Front here that was all glass. This would be the south side. I'm not sure, but I think they actually doubled and then some the size of the bank building itself. They did remove all this. This is not a solid brick building. It's a brick veneer building. Nice windows there, and nice fan windows in here. The Italian arches on the on the building. Anybody know the gentleman? Is that one 
webcam rotors, guys? I don't know. So here's the old building, and then this is the new. There's a drive-up window. Assuming now this is the mesh they pulled over the span crete floor and then they're going to pour concrete on here, I think, but I'm not sure. Was that the furnace they put up there or was that the air conditioner? Furnace was in the basement. Furnace was in the basement. No, 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 furnace was on the roof. What furnace was on the roof? I think where the guys were with the sledgehammer, I think that's when he broke the wall in between the old building and the building they built. This is a picture of Danny Mauer. Yeah, this is Danny. Tell because he's got a cigarette in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Jack Wettenkamp. Um, okay. First gentleman to use the. Use the drive through. Okay, good. And there he is from the inside. <laughs> And that is Roland Vogt, uh, Roland Ohm, and Emmett Rodewald supervising from the inside. <laughs> well, that's the counter they were standing at, right? Yes. This is the door. <coughs> Would you know where this is? That's the office. That's the inside office. Can you explain what all this is? I think, I think that's the tub that we had, isn't it? With all the accounts. One loan card, is that Carolyn? All cards. Loans. Loan cards? Loan cards. Could be some savings and checking also. You don't know who the, the, the people are? It's possible one is me. In the back, it looks like Carolyn. Oh, way back here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's Marilyn or probably Marilyn and me. Uh -huh. And I think this is the last picture. This is the way the bank looks now, or it, that it looked like, right when it was finished. What is going to happen to the bank building now? Just be empty, or is it sold, or does it sold? Supposedly, it is sold. Um, the last couple of weeks, there has been a little activity. They uh, had the well testers there one day, and they were testing the well. Um, one of the customers of the bank that does carpeting was there measuring for carpets. So I'm assuming that they're getting closer to uh, getting it ready to uh, be used. Supposedly, it was bought, uh, I guess, by Enrico. They're going to use it for offices across the street. Okay. And I, I think they had some problems uh, that it took this long because probably some of the well had to be tested, the whole thing. They had some problems with that. Any questions yet? Down here we have one. Okay. We got a young lady who had her hand up. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Edith, let's see. I was just wondering what happened to the stuff that was supposed to be passed around. It never got here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman here has a, perhaps a question or something. Go right ahead, please. Okay. My name is Rob Spaulding. I don't have a question, but I have a comment, and that is that the day that they closed Newton State Bank was a day that is a sad day in our history because that place was great. The people there were always great, and they were about Newton, and that is a part that is, is I'm, I'm missing 
greatly in my life now. Okay. And it's, it's going to be a part that I think what we just seen today is going to be cherished as a great memory okay. and, and missed. I think we ought to give all the employees a big round of applause. Very good. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming. It was wonderful. And I mean, everybody got educated, you know, with the whole Newton Bank system, including uh, Frederick started it. So thank you, Frederick. And Charlie followed. And Charlie and Frederick did most of the work in this. And I thank both of you also. Next month, we're going to have a very exciting program. And it's going to be our own Charlie Bauer. He is going to be doing it on the Vietnam War. Correct, Charlie? Yeah, okay. Oh, and I don't have my stuff here. It's going to be May, um, May 10th. And it will be in this room, and it will start at 6.30, and everyone is invited. If you want to be on the mailing list, then you have to give me your address. So thank you all for coming, and it was wonderful. We're going to take another, just a quick run through for... I, I got one down here. I got a question okay. from... Uh, from Okay, we have a young lady who raised her hand, and she says she might have a comment. Go right ahead. Mary Jane Korleski, Rots, originally from Newton. Okay. I just want to let you know just how helpful the Newton uh, Bank people really are. Last spring, when I went to the cemetery at Newton to put my flowers out on my parents' grave, um, I couldn't get the thing put together, so I thought, now what am I going to do? Drive way back to Two Rivers and get a pliers? No, I think I'll take a drive over to Newton Bank and I'll see if they can help me out. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one announcement coming from the young lady. I'm Kathy Sixel on May 3rd at a Range Line Inn that's uh, near Sheboygan Falls. Uh, Sheboygan County is having a local history fair. The tickets are $21.50 uh, and that includes the meal, and there'll be speakers and music, and it'll be a wonderful day. So anybody that wants to attend, you can contact me, and I'll see to that you get a ticket. Thank you. we got one more commercial here. On April 26th in the Cleveland Room, the Local History Alliance of Manitowoc County will be meeting here, and Jerry O'Neill is our, our go-between between here or the liaison person to the county here. And we're going to be hosting it. We're going to start at 6 o'clock, and everybody's welcome. We have people from all the different local historical groups in Manitowoc County, like Roger Street Fishing, uh, make the Friends of St. Patrick, uh, St. Asians. We got Keo and Silver Lake. Silver Lake, Sisters of Franciscan Charity. And all we do is basically discuss what each group is doing. It's a, it's a short meeting, but it, it gives you an idea. The last time we met was at Two Rivers at the Wood Type Museum, and I was just simply amazed at that. That place there made posters for Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson, and it's still in operation today. If you got a chance, you got to see the equipment and how they made that wood type. It's just simply amazing. Are we going to end now, Jerry? And don't forget to tell them about the photos that are in the Cleveland room. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, gonna do that. Okay. Um, you want to run this way? That way? Either way. This way. We'll let you end off. <laughs> just, your, just your identification. Um, I'm Laurie Pearson. I just thought of a funny little story, if I could tell it, okay. yeah, about the bank. Um, we closed from 12 to 1, Yeah. and we often took naps there. I, I usually went home by my parents for lunch, but Danny Mauer usually napped under one of the counters, and Marilyn also. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knew that. <laughs> and I know one day that I stayed and all three of us were sleeping and I don't know if Carolyn was not working that day or what, but we didn't wake up in time. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and there was somebody at the door. <laughs> Carolyn usually had opened back up when she came. And we heard somebody at the door and we couldn't just pop up from under the counters. <laughs> so Dan got on his hands and knees and crawled down the length of the five teller stations into his office and stood up in there and then came walking out like he came out of his office. <laughs> and he distracted the person wherever it was, I can't remember, enough for us to get up and get woke up. <laughs> So we had a lot of good times there. We like to scare Marilyn about mice. <laughs> Danny once uh, 
came after her with a broom and he hit on the floor by her feet and she fell over backwards and hurt her tailbone. <laughs> so we had a lot of good times and it was very informal. Very good. Just thought I could share that now. Well, thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Okay, and your name, please? Colleen Dang. Thank you. Elwood Free. Thank you. John Wiegan. Thank you. We'll go through. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Carolyn Huckman. Thank you. Apollonia Geraldson. Thank you. And you ladies, thank you very much for sharing this evening. And we have a gentleman here. Rick Byersdorf. Thank you. Edna Huckman. Okay, thank you. I'll take Thank you. Thank you. Salma Volgo. Thank you. Mary Jane Rotz. Thank you for coming. Audrey Erdl. Thank you for coming. Larry Brookshire. Thank you, Larry. Bonnie Barnes. Thank you. Bill Garamba. Thank you. Geraldine Chapler. Thank you for coming. Arlene Hubbard. Thank you. The Mary Wettentamp. Thank you for sharing also. Mullard Matthias. Thank you. Alice Matthias. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Irene Dine. Irene, thank you. Joel Kress. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> you were high power tonight. <laughs> Peg Kress. Thank you. Kathy Wagner. Thank you. Diane Luco. Thank you for coming. Laurel Buchanan. Thank you so much for coming. Joan Walk. Thank you for coming. Joe Newman. Thank you for coming. Lloyd Geraldson. Thank you, Lloyd. Frederick Jacoby. Thank you, Fred. Paul Jacoby. Paul, thank you. Rob Spaulding. Thank you very much. <laughs> Joan Geraldson. Thank you very much. Heather Geraldson. Thank you. Katie Schill. Thank you. Victor Schill. Thank you. Melvin Nunes. Thank you. Gary Leonard. Thank you. <laughs> Mary Ann Thompson. Thank you. Bernice Erlicker. Thank you. Cheryl Bauer. Thank you, Cheryl. Lisa Elfson. Thank you very much. Marie Rosenbauer. Thank you very much. Earl Elder. Thank you. Outstanding job you did and to take time to come. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we don't have anything else. You're excused or you can visit. Doesn't make any difference. <laughs>